So uh, this week we are excited to have Justin Troika from Davidson uh, College give us a talk. And uh, he will be speaking about split graphs, combinatorial species, and asymptotics. Um, so uh, without further ado, go ahead and uh, take us away. All right, yeah. So it's uh, great to be here on campus. Um, as you can see, I'm in a room full of people. <laughs> Um, yeah, and this is, so I'm Justin Troika, it's, I, yeah, I'm uh, at Davidson College, oh yeah, thank you, uh, for two years, this is what my face looks like, <laughs> uh, I'll keep this on for, most of it. can, can you all hear me, yeah, we're, this is a small room, okay, um, can people on Zoom hear me okay, probably, if not, let me know, and I'm, <laughs> so yeah, it's great to be here, and I am, uh, thank you, um, I'm, I'm uh, going to talk to you about a research project that I did and that I'm kind of still doing part of on split graphs. Um, so I don't know who in the audience is dealing with sort of does uh, like enumerative combinatorics, but that's sort of my area is enumerative combinatorics. And I do all kinds of things with that, with usually counting permutations. This talk is going to be more about counting graphs. And like I was telling some of you before the talk, um, you, counting graphs is not a good idea. <laughs> There's a there's too many of them, which sounds funny, but like so, uh, you know, the number of simple graphs on n vertices. Well, each pair of vertices, there either can be an edge between them or not be an edge. So that's two to the power of the number of pairs of vertices, right? And so the number of pairs of so that's two to the power of n choose two. So that's that's not just exponential, like two to the n. That's like two to the you know o of n squared. That's it's uh, which is even bigger than n factorial, it turns out. So n fact, and so usually when I'm working with permutations, like n factorial, there's n factorial permutations of size n. That's the already kind of pushing it in terms of how many combinatorial objects we're dealing with. So this is just crazy. But you know, there's the interesting thing is there's still there's still meaningful things that can be said about like the number of graphs with certain properties of each given uh, number of vertices. And I'm going to tell you about some of those sort of recent. Uh, areas of research, sort of avenues of research that I found interesting and that I have contributed a little bit to. Uh, so yeah, okay, let's let's get to it. So yeah, there's the outline of the talk. First, I'll give you a little bit of background to tell you what split graphs are. Uh, we're also going to, um, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, labeled graphs versus unlabeled graphs. The distinction is important when you're counting them. Uh, and usually labeled structures are a lot easier to count I you know went through the fact that there were two to the power of n choose two uh, labeled graphs on n vertices. But if you want just isomorphism classes of graphs, that's a much harder problem, and you have to use group theory basically, and you have to count you know symmetry groups of different graphs and things like like that. Uh, and then uh, then we also have then and then I'll tell you sort of what I my my contribution to this. So. Um, and I drew the drew all the pictures this morning before I drove over, drove down here from Davidson. Uh, a, a split graph is this is how it's defined. It's a graph whose vertices can be partitioned into a clique, a complete graph, and a stable set or an independent set. And we're going to be always referring to the clique as K, K for clique, obviously. Whoever you know, I'm not going to say anything else about that. And a stable set, it will be called S. So here's an example of one. As you can see, all four of these vertices are adjacent right every pair of vertices on the left is adjacent to each other uh every pair of vertices on the right is not adjacent and then we have whatever edges we like between the two pairs they're you know uh between the two sides uh similar idea to a bipartite graph except that instead of two independent sets with some edges between them we have a click and an independent set um and that is that that uh there actually is a pretty uh important connection between these and bipartite graphs from the point of view of what i'm going to be talking to you about so we'll get to that soon. Um, so a then a KS partition is a partition of a graph vertices in this way, where you have a click and you have an independent set. So these are the types of graphs that we're talking about. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, I mean I'll try to stop periodically and see you know what questions people have. But if you know if anyone wants to just raise your hand, I feel like it's a small enough group we can sort of uh, be a little bit informal. So yeah. Um, so that's what a split graph is. Uh, and so now I'll tell you a little bit of their significance. They've been studied for several decades. They're a well-known class of perfect graphs. Um, so, and it turns out split graphs are precisely the graphs such that uh, the graph is a chordal graph and its complement is chordal. Chordal meaning 
any cycle of size four or more has, uh, you know, it has a, a, a chord basically, you know, connecting to vertices that are not adjacent in the cycle. Uh, so uh, that, that, that's a different characterization of split graphs than what I've just given you, but it's equivalent. Uh, there's a summary of some of the known facts about split graphs in this textbook. There's a, the, there's a section of the textbook on split graphs. Um, sort of the, the main paper from this era on split graphs uh, is from uh, by Hammer and I don't know how to say this person's name, Simeone or Simeone, 1991, or 1981. Uh, where they characterized split graphs by their degree sequence. There's a theorem in this paper that says a graph is a split graph if and only if the, you know, the, the multi-set of the degrees of its vertices satisfies such and such properties. So you can tell whether a graph is a split graph just by looking at the degrees of the vertices. And hence, there's an efficient algorithm for identifying split graphs. You just look at the list of the degrees, see if that list satisfies the properties, um, which is not quite, which is not really all that relevant to what we're talking about today. Just wanted to give you a sense of the history here um, and how they were studied by, you know, real graph theorists. And uh, and now now there's me coming in from enumerative combinatorics. <laughs> um, so and so here's the the counting stuff that has been done on this. So uh, Royal in 2000. So again, there's the uh, distinction between counting the unlabeled split graphs versus counting the labeled ones. And we'll I'll talk more about that in the part two of the three, you know, three parts of this talk. Uh, but for now, so the enumeration of unlabeled split graphs. Uh, so in 2000, Royal found a bijection between the unlabeled split graphs on n vertices and minimal set covers of size n, which I actually don't remember what minimal set covers are, but there's some sort of, you know, uh, graph or hypergraph like object that has certain properties. Uh, then the 2018, the, a paper by Collins and Trank, which is uh, I think, oh no, this is, I forgot, this is, this should say, let me annotate this, is this going to work? This should be Chang, Collins, and Trank, 2018. Uh, yes, that showed up, wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, wrote, have the, a paper where they establish bijections with several different uh, combinatorial objects, including bicolored graphs, where the two color classes are colored red and green such that no green vertex is isolated. Um, and I am going to show you a little bit more about that later on in the talk. Uh, they also, there's a connection to bipartite posets, essentially establishing that all of these different types of combinatorial things are uh, counted by the same sequence of numbers. And they, they prove this using bijections between, between these various objects. Um, yeah, and then the, uh, so then for labeled split graphs, in 1985, it's shown that a bunch of different types of graphs have the same, asymptotically the same enumeration. So this is an asymptotic enumeration question. Uh, uh, that, so we're saying S, Sn, denoting the number of labeled split graphs on n vertices, is the same as Bn, the number of labeled bicolored graphs on n vertices. Uh, so these are asymptotically the same as n goes to infinity. and it also uh, establishes that one of the other types of graphs they were counting already had a known formula. And this is essentially what the formula was. It was some constant times uh, n to the n over two times two to the n squared over four. This should be understood as, so like this term. So, okay, if you think about how to actually count by colored graphs, first you can choose how many vertices are red versus green, right? Or you can, you, and that's so that you'll have a term for each k. Uh, for each k, you'll have, you know, there's k green vertices and minus k red vertices. And then you have to choose k of the n vertices to be green, let's say. And so there, that's where this bi binomial coefficient comes from. And then there's two to the power of k times n minus k. Well, there are I'll, the formula, I'll show the formula later in the talk. I just wanted to point out that this term here is actually just the middle term of the formula, which is saying that basically the majority, though not, uh, the proportion does not go to one as n goes to infinity, but a majority of, I think it's a majority, uh, at the very least a constant fraction of, uh, a, approaching a constant fraction of the bicolored graphs on n vertices are, have, are equally distributed between the two colors. Um, but in any case, uh, th this was done in 1985. And then in 2015, uh, there was a, uh, 
Bina and Prebill gave, give a formula for the number of split graphs as a double uh, labeled split graphs as a double summation involving binomial coefficients. So yeah, are there any any questions so far, either from either from uh, the the people watching on Zoom or from the people in the room here? All right, let me figure out how to. If I go to the next slide, the hold on. If I go to the next slide, the person's name will still be there. So I have to figure that out. Um, here we go. Clear. Oh, okay. <laughs> there. So um, now more on split graphs. And this is really mostly going to be going into the Collins and Trank paper, as well as a predecessor. Oh, Chang Collins and Trank paper, as well as a predecessor paper. Oh, no, this one. Yeah, as well as. This one is just Collins and Trank. There's a different paper that's Chang Collins and Trank. OK, so I didn't even need to write that in in the first place. In any case, this is sort of what their research was on. A split graph is balanced if, so this is, I'm introducing the notion of a balanced split graph. And what that means is that the KS partition, in other words, the way of breaking it down into a click and an independent set is unique. Um, it is, the KS partition may be unique and may not be. So, and if it's unbalanced, if there's more than one KS partition. Uh, now, so the example that I showed you at the beginning is an unbalanced split graph. And what makes it unbalanced, so here it is. And what you can see is that actually both of these vertices are adjacent to everything in the click, but they're also not adjacent to anything in the independent set, in the stable set. So we can swing one of them over. And this, calling it a swing vertex was not my idea. That was in the, the paper that I was referred to earlier, the uh, Collins and Trank. Uh, we can swing this vertex over here and put it in S instead of in K. And this is still a perfectly valid KS partition where we now have just these three vertices in the K side and these four in the S side, right? Because this is adjacent to none of these, so it can go there as well. We can't move both of them because they're adjacent to each other, but we can move one of them. Uh, yeah. And so what else do I want to say about this? Right. So now, and this is sort of the only thing that, the only difference is that in any, any two KS partitions just differ by one in the size of the parts. Like there's, you know, you can't, uh, so in this case, K will always have four vertices or three vertices. Um, so it's, when, when it's unbalanced, there's not really too much uh, freedom in what you can do. But in any case, uh, the, uh, right. And so we're gonna call this partition, the K max partition, because it's of the two sizes of K, this is the larger one. And then this one is going to be the S max partition uh, because S is the larger of the two in this one. So, um, right. So here is sort of uh, one of the main theorems of the work of Chang, Collins, and Trank from 2016, which is that this number, the number of unlabeled, the tilde, anytime there's a tilde over a letter, it's going to be in unlabeled graphs. The number of unlabeled uh, unbalanced split graphs on n vertices is equal to, I mean, basically what this is saying is this is the number of split graphs of any, with any number of vertices up to n minus one, right? Uh, or you can state this in terms of generating functions in this way. So the generating, the ordinary generating function for the un, unbalanced is equal to x over one minus x times uh, the, uh, the, the, the total split graph. Uh, uh, generating function. Uh, and the I will show you a sketch of this proof. And we're really considering it as sort of this. So when you think of it this way, uh, when you multiply, of course, when you multiply two generating functions, two ordinary generating functions, what that amounts to is that we have some sort of uh, non-empty sequence and then also a split graph, right? So x over 1 minus x, rep, 1 over 1 minus x would just be some sequence of, you know, points, and then x over 1 minus x means it's a non-empty one. Uh, and so the proof of this formula is this. Given an unbalanced split graph like this one, what we do is take the k max partition, and the k max partition is unique uh, if we're talking about unlabeled graphs. It's, there's only one possible k max partition. Uh, and then what we're going to do is take the swing vertices and just remove them from the graph. And so this graph just becomes this. Right. So, and then what remains is an arbitrary split graph, and that's essentially the proof, because here these, you know, this uh, because it's a k max partition, there must 
and it's unbalanced, there must be at least one, one swing vertex. So this x over 1 minus x represents the swing vertices that are in k of a k-max partition. Uh, and then when we take those off, what remains is the s, the arbitrary split graph, which may end up being balanced or unbalanced. Uh, yeah, and so this is the proof that was in that paper from, I guess, five years ago now. Uh, and the thing I want to point out is that this does not work for labeled graphs, right? So this paper was not really concerned with labeled graphs. This was about just counting isomorphism classes of these, which is, you know, a pretty normal thing to do with graphs. Uh, but the reason this does not work for labeled graphs is because it relies on the uniqueness of the k-max partition. And it's possible that a split graph can have many distinct uh, k-max partitions that are isomorphic to each other. And so when you're counting unlabeled structures, would just count as one thing, but counts as many things if you are looking at the labeled structures, right? There's, right, think of like, it's the difference between, well, so, it, you know, it's the difference between moving this vertex to the other side or moving that vertex to the other side. The two partitions are isomorphic to each other, but if these vertices are distinguishable, they're technically not the same thing. Um, so, yeah, and a lot of my work sort of focuses on, on untangling that and trying to find something that generalizes where it works sort of on a level that can be applied to labeled or unlabeled, essentially, in a sense that I will make clear. Um, yeah, this would be another good time, I think, to stop for. Are there any questions or you know observe or you know any comments people want to make or anything? I suppose the x of zero and x of one. Sorry. Oh, on the on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is just this is uh, signifying that we're adding up all the all the number like the number of zero vertex split graphs plus the number of one vertex split graphs plus the number of two vertex split graphs and so on. So, for, so for, for zero, the empty graph. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, you have to, I guess for zero, let me think. Yeah, is the, the empty graph, the empty graph can indeed then be partitioned into that because, right, then K would be empty, S would be empty, that's allowed, I guess. And then S1 would be the graph on one, would represent the graph on one vertex, I guess, which is, uh, yeah, that's certainly, yeah, that's a split graph. And I guess it's an unbalanced split graph because that vertex could count as K or S. Um, and then S, and then I think from two and on, it becomes more understandable what's meant, I think. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. The base case, uh, you, we do have to make sure we have the base case, but there's a natural way of doing it. Yeah, yeah, good. Anyone else? Well, that means that you are allowing in the partition and partition class. Uh, what was that? You are allowing many partition and partition class. So the complete class. Uh, yes, uh huh, yes. Either K or S can be empty. Yeah, there's no restriction on them being non empty, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, anyone else? Okay, all right. So now we're going to, I promise you, we talk about labeled versus unlabeled graphs. Uh, so this gets into a lot of if you've ever studied, you know, like uh, the like the Polya enumeration theory, uh, that sort of thing is really what is coming into play here. And I'm not really, you know, I could, you know, you could teach an entire class on that, and I'm really not going to be able to go into the details. But that's really what's going on here is that we're talking about a group action where and counting, you know, isomorphism cla or equivalence classes under the group action. And in this case, the group is going to be the entire symmetric group um, on n letters. Okay, so uh, and to, instead of going through all of the details of that, I'm just going to illustrate with an example. Uh, a labeled graph is a graph with n vertices labeled one through n, uh, and yeah, so each each uh, and then each of the labels is used exactly once. So you can think of it like it's a graph where the vertex set is the equal to the numbers one through n. So there are eight labeled graphs on three vertices, and here they all here they all are. As you can see, we count these as three different graphs because the edge one, two is different from the edge two, three, and they're different from the edge one, three, right? Um, and so there's eight of these. And I arrange them so that each one is sort of above its complement, which I thought was nice. Uh, so now what we can do with these, right? Uh, we can think about uh, sort of uh, bijections that relabel the graph. So we can say, you know, in this graph, what if we change the one to a two and change the two to a three and change the three to a one? And when we do that, right, so that's some permutation of the numbers one, two, and three. And so permutations of size three, uh, or let's say the symmetric group uh, on three, on the numbers one through three, 
uh, induces a group action on these objects where by relabeling them. And so that's what this diagram shows. So as you can see, first of all, let's look at this graph. If you switch one and two, it's the same graph because one and two started out being adjacent. When you switch one and two, they are still adjacent. So the transposition that, that transposes one and two fixes this graph. This graph is sort of is fixed by or is invariant under uh, that transposition. But then if we apply the one, two, three, the cycle, the three cycle, then one becomes relabeled as two. So two becomes relabeled as three. So the edge becomes two to three. That's what this graph is. So one, two, three induces uh, you know, a map that sends this graph to this graph. And then this graph gets sent to this graph. This graph gets sent to this one again. And so as you can see then, the, the idea here is that uh, we, the, uh, we have a, an S3 action on the set of eight labeled graphs on three vertices. Uh, and I didn't draw in every single one of the six uh, elements of the group, but you know you can imagine how you would like so two like the two three transposition would have this one fixed, uh, and it would switch this one and this one right, and then similar story down here, and then of course every element of S three keeps this fixed because no matter how you permute one two and three no edges there's only one graph with no edges right, and same thing with the the complete graph, and so what we what happens is we get these orbits which I've drawn a box around each of the orbits of this group action. Right, so the orbits are just you know you the equivalence classes where you consider two things equivalent if there's a group element there's a permutation that maps one to the other. So in this case, it's all of the ways of relabeling a graph are in the same equivalence class. And so what we get from this is uh, we can think of each equivalence class as an unlabeled graph because we're sort of considering all of the labelings in the same uh, as the same graph if we are considering an isomorphism class here. So an unlabeled graph, then we can define to be simply an equivalence class of labeled graphs uh, under the action of the symmetric group, right? Uh, or you know, even more generally, you could just say it's isomorphism classes of graphs. But then you're dealing with you know set, sets that are too big to be sets, <laughs> and so we could do it this way instead. This way, we also get to do more combinatorics because the symmetric group acts on it, and that's nice. Uh, and so there are four unlabeled graphs on three vertices. That's one, two, three, and four. But of course, you know, they're sort of different, right? This graph has, uh, is these two graphs are perfectly symmetric and these two graphs have some asymmetry to them. And so there are more things in these equivalence classes than in these. Uh, and that sort of, anytime you're trying to count unlabeled graphs, you kind of have to think about like, you know, counting the ones that have certain uh, symmetries. Uh, and then you use like the Burnside enumeration lemma, where it's like, the, I guess the lemma that is not Burnside's, I've heard it called, uh, because it was actually by like Cauchy and Frobenius or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, to count the orbits under some group action. Uh, yeah, questions about this so far? Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, I think, and I, I just think it's it's uh, really fun to think about. I like thinking about group actions a lot. <laughs> so, uh, so now to give an example of the sort of uh, counting problems involved. So as we talked about, the number of all labeled graphs on n vertices is two to the power of n choose two, uh, which we can call g sub n. Now the number of all unlabeled graphs is, I, you know, it, you, it's, I didn't really, you know, it's hard to, I don't know it off the top of my head like I do the other one. You know, it's some. It's there are several nested summations involved uh, because you have to count the uh, equivalence class, and you have to kind of do it according to like you know looking at sort of the different symmetries and looking at how many graphs are fixed by every possible uh, permutation that that induces a relabeling. And this was uh, found by Ploya in the 1940s. Uh, you know, as part of the sort of uh, uh, theory that he was developing for enumeration under group action, which is a very fun topic, as I've said. Uh, and so uh, now in more generally, right? We, so like I said, this is an example of the sort of thing we can think about with uh, what's called combinatorial species. And the idea here is if we have some, some kind of combinatorial structure, we're getting very general here. <laughs> if we have some kind of combinatorial structure where uh, Fn counts the labeled structures and Fn with a squiggle over it counts the unlabeled structures, then here's what we can do. We can define uh, f of x, uh, the, this is the exponential generating function for the labeled structures. We can also define uh, the ordinary generating function for the unlabeled structures, but just by putting the those, those counting sequences as the coefficients. And uh, 
briefly, the reason why labeled structures get exponential generating functions while unlabeled structures get ordinary generating functions really boils down to the multiplication rule. When you multiply two ordinary generating functions together, the coefficients of the product are a convolution of the coefficients of the two generating functions. And that's exactly the type of multiplication we want when we're looking at unlabeled structures, because uh, multiplication of generating functions of ordinary generating functions for unlabeled structures corresponds to sort of a uh, concatenation of the uh, of the unlabeled structures that you, that we're counting. But then if they're labeled structures, uh, we're not just concatenating them. We're also choosing which label, which subset of the labels to use on the first one and which subset of the labels to use on the second one. So it's not just a convolution here. What we really want is a convolution times n choose k. Um, and that multiplication by n choose k is achieved by using an exponential generating function where we have this n factorial in the denominator. Um, so just briefly, that's sort of why, that's why it's different. Um, and so if you're ever trying to count things and you're not sure whether to use exponential generating functions or ordinary generating functions, it really boils down to, uh, you know, do we have to, uh, are we worrying about which labels go on each thing or not? Um, and again, that's sort of a very like broad, uh, <laughs> broad strokes idea here. I, I'm not, I'm not saying anything rigorous here, but, uh, that's the general idea. Uh, okay, so this slide is going to be I'm uh, just it's it's not really going to come up that much in the presentation. If you don't understand what a combinatorial species is after this, you will still get what the rest of the slides are saying. Uh, but one way of defining it is basically as a sequence of sets, one set for each natural number, where, uh, where Fn is equipped with a group action by the symmetric group on n letters for each n. This is the sort of more, this is the more concrete way of doing it. In a little bit, I'll get to sort of the, the, the real way to do it, which involves category theory. But for now, this is what a species, this is how I think of a species anyway. Uh, and then, uh, so this set here, what we're thinking of it as is the set of labeled uh, structures of that type. And then this, which is the set of orbits under the group action is the set of unlabeled structures, right? So uh, in the example of just the species of all graphs, this would be the set of labeled graphs that those eight graphs that I drew, and then they're, they're, uh, they're acted on by S3 or in general, the you know, graphs on N vertices are acted on by Sn. And then the, or the orbits under that group action, the, this is the set of orbits under that group action. And that is, we're, we can think of that as the set of unlabeled structures, right? Uh, now, yeah, so an isomorphism between species is going to be then a bijection between the sets of structures that commutes with the SN action. Uh, so it's essentially a, uh, it's a, oh gosh, yeah, it's an isomorphism between the, the uh, like the SN sets, so to speak. Uh, it, it uh, you know, so if you relabel the F structures in some, some way and then apply the bijection, it's the same as if you first apply the bijection and then relabel the G structures in the same way, right? So it's just, it's sort of a natural isomorphism. Uh, so uh, and really what this means in terms of labelings and relabelings is that it's a bijection on the level of the labeled structures that respects relabeling so that it also, in particular, it also will induce a bijection on the unlabeled structures as well. Um, and it's actually even stronger than that. It's stronger than the labeled structures being the same and the unlabeled structures being the same. When two species are isomorphic, it sort of signifies a combinatorial equivalence that is really nice to have. And it's saying that, you know, for combinatorial purposes, these are really the same object. And so when we make a state, when we have a generating function identity, and we generalize it to a, an identity of combinatorial species, uh, that is saying something much stronger. Um, and that is how I convince you that the re results I'm about to show you are actually good. <laughs> um, and like I said, so the real definition of a species, if you, does anyone here know category theory or like have been exposed to category theory a little bit? So yeah, me also a little bit. But these are the words involved, uh, that a species is a functor from the category of finite sets with bijections to the category of finite sets with functions. Uh, if you go through the definition of a functor 
and you write down what it means in this specific case, you'll basically get, and then, and well, and then you look at what it means specifically when your finite sets involved are the numbers one through n, you will get exactly what I wrote up here. Uh, I think I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> um, and then the real definition of a species isomorphism is simply a natural equivalence of two functors. If the species are functors, uh, then a natural equivalence between two functors is a thing from category theory. And that's what it means for two species to be isomorphic. So very, very fun stuff. Uh, but you don't actually need to know any category theory to, to understand species theory. Um, so yeah, what, uh, what questions do people have about this? Because I know I just threw a lot at you. But after this, we're going to get back to split graphs. All right, so back to split graphs. Um, so yeah, this is a paper that ended up being published in 2019 in the Electronic Journal of Combinatorics. Uh, and so here's what, uh, here's, here's, uh, here's the, the main idea. So this is the theorem that I showed you earlier. I showed you sort of a sketch of the proof. Um, it was very nice. It involved the swing vertices. And uh, what I did was I proved a species version of this where this U is the species of unbalanced split graphs. S, this S, is the species of split graphs, just unbalanced or balanced. And then the, the E here uh, denote, this is sort of one of the sort of basic types of species. Uh, you know, it's just the species of sets. So the species of sets is uh, for each N, there's only one set, or for each, for each possible label set. Wait, how do I define this? Right, so for, so for, yeah, for each n, it's just the only set of size n is just the numbers one through n in a set. You can think of it as like a set of isolated vertices. Um, and then all of the relabelings just give you the same set back because there's no relationships between any of the vertices or any of the, you know, numbers one through n. They're just a, a you know, they're just a, an undifferentiated set of, of things. Um, and so for the species of sets, since there's just one of each size, the unlabeled uh, generating function for that is one minus one over X. And so when we specialize to unlabeled structures by putting in for the species U, we put in the ordinary generating function for the unlabeled, no, the, for the, the, yeah, for the unlabeled things, same thing for S. And then we put in that, uh, we put in this for E. Then we get back the original theorem by Chang, Collins and Trank, uh, this one here, we get this back exactly. And if you get bored for the rest of the talk, you can try, you know, get out some scrap paper and try to work that out yourself. Take this, you know, weird formula and put in, uh, put in e of x equals this, and then when the dust settles, you do actually get uh, this back, which is which was, you know, I was <laughs> relieved that that happened. Um, and then, if you, on the other hand, if you specialize to labeled structures, which because there's again there's one set of each size, the uh, the set species. The generating function is e to the x since we're doing an exponential generating function. So if you put an e to the x here and here, uh, then what you get is a new enumeration theorem that expresses labeled unbalanced split graphs in terms of labeled split graphs, which is not as nice as this, but it's the same type of thing. And both of those identities come from this, which is stronger than both of them and sort of encompasses them both. Uh, and I will say the way that I got this was not direct. I mean, look, there's subtraction, there's division. It's not going to be direct. <laughs> um, so what I mean, it amounted to uh, the same type of proof that I did. Let me go back a little bit. The same type of proof that I showed you in this picture, but I just had to be a lot more careful about, um, you know, whether there was a unique K-max partition or not. And, you know, sort of looking at um, different types of uh, split graphs. And it sort of, you know, there, I had to define, you know, a few other, where were we here? I had to define a few other types of species and then get a bunch of equations relating them that start out on like the bijective level, but then end up being indirect because I had to, you know, basically solve a system of equations um, where the things in the equations are these symbolic uh, combinatorial species. Uh, so that's fun. It, it actually, well, I, you know, it was messy, but it was, I, it was, it is actually fun, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, the so the point of this slide is this cool thing generalizes to the level of combinatorial species. That's the main idea here. Uh, yeah, uh, questions. What are people's questions about this? Uh, 
All right, so moving on. I mentioned that bicolored graphs were going to come up. So here's where they're coming up. A bicolored graph is a bipartite graph with a chosen bipartition. It's basically, we use bicolored graphs when we want to talk about bipartite graphs, but we don't want to have to worry about the fact that there might be you know, different ways of splitting up the vertices. In particular, if it's not a connected graph, each connected component, you can decide to put you know, one of the classes on the left and one on the right, or you can switch them, right? And so the total number of ways of, of coloring a bipartite graph will be two to the power of the number of, uh, of uh, connected components, right? And so that is annoying to have to deal with. Um, and so to get around that, we can instead look at bicolored graphs, which means it's a bipartite graph equipped with a specific bipartition. Right. And so, um, and for the sake of, you can think of it as like one part is colored green, the other is colored red. And the reason I chose green and red for this paper and for this presentation is because they're going to end up corresponding to the K and the S. And so there's Kelly green and there's scarlet red. Uh, and so those are the KS partition is what they're going to turn out to be. Uh, and so this is an example of a bicolored graph. And as what I was saying was, so for instance, this is an isolated vertex. So like we could choose to put that on this side or we could put it here and those would be the same bipartite graph, but we're counting them as different bicolored graphs if we decide to color this one green instead and put it over here. Um, or like this component here, you know, we could have put in these put these two vertices here and this one here and we could or we could have put this one here and color it green and put it there and then put these two vertices color them red put them here. Uh, and so those would all count as the same bipartite graph, but they count as different bicolored graphs. And so the number of bicolored graphs on n vertices is simply this summation, because again, we're choosing k of them to be green, then uh, choosing uh, two to the power of you know, k times n minus k is the number of ways of choosing the edges between the two halves, between the two colored classes. Uh, and then this is the thing, this is the same, uh, term that showed up earlier in the presentation of just, uh, right, this is the um, this is sort of dominated by the middle term of this. So that's why there's n choose floor of n over two. And then the, if k is n over two, n minus k is uh, also n over two, and then you get n squared over four. And then the theta of just means it's a constant, basically it's a constant times it. I didn't want to get into the details, but the constant actually depends on whether, uh, whether uh, whether n is odd or even, it's a just slightly different constant. Um, yeah, and this is yeah. Huh. So um, so yeah, bicolored graphs are easy to count, even though these again these numbers are way too big, but they are easy to express. And now what we can do, and uh, what we can do is express. Well, so this is for the labeled ones. Again, the unlabeled ones uh, is harder, and you have to. So I mentioned that for graphs, unlabeled graphs were counted by Polya in you know, his seminal uh, work on you know, uh, uh, enumeration under group action. Uh, the same ideas work to count the uh, bicolored graphs, uh, unlabeled bicolored graphs or unlabeled bipartite graphs. You can sort of, if you find one, you can use that to find the other. Uh, and that was actually done by, I believe, yeah, by Philip Hanlon who I know as the president, current president of Dartmouth College where I went to grad school, but he's also a mathematician and he did stuff with, uh, among other areas he worked in, maybe still works in, uh, enumerative graph theory and proved. Uh, so I got to cite his paper and that was kind of fun. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I mentioned this, right? The, uh, oh, I did not mention yet this result, but this was a result in Collins and Trank's paper. One of their bijections that they found establishes this, that the bicolored graphs, unlabeled bicolored graphs, which again were counted by uh, Philip Hanlon. I think I have that right. Uh, um, are, so the generating fun the ordinary generating function for those is equal to one over one minus x times this one, uh, which is the one for split graphs. So this here relates the bicolored graphs to the split graphs, the numbers of them. Um, and a sketch of the proof is basically, is there a picture on this slide? There's not. That's okay. Uh, the sketch of the proof will be given a bicolored graph. What we're going to do is remove all isolated green vertices, and then what we're and then make the remaining green vertices into a click. Uh, so what this does is it results in a split graph in its S max partition. Okay, and so what that means is a bicolored graph can be decomposed into 
some isolated green vertices and a, an underlying split graph. And this works on the unlabeled level because of the uniqueness of an SMAX partition. This would not work for labeled because, well, I, this same argument doesn't work for labeled because of the same issues we talked about before. Um, however, I did find that actually uh, I um, proved this using, um, you know, that this result about species, that the species of bicolored graphs is one over one minus X. So this would actually represent the, the species of uh, linear orders or sequences, uh, which is sort of permutations considered as like a list of the numbers one through N in some order uh, times the S uh, split graph species, uh, which I was surprised it came out to look exactly like this because again, the proof technique used here doesn't actually apply on the level of species. The way I proved this was very indirect. Do I say that on this slide? No, I don't. So yeah, it's an open problem that I hope to either work on or give to you know, a potential student to work on is to find a bijective proof of this because it looks so simple, but the way I proved it was using all those other results that I had before, basically. Uh, and, you know, it was a, I had to, it was, in, it's indirect. I had to, you know, prove some other thing that was not as nice and then like solve for some things and then, you know, uh, and then get this, uh, get this equation in this form. So it was not a direct proof, but it seems like there should be a bijective proof, right? Um, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, and then I also want to point out that specializing to labeled structures, um, well, so, okay, you can see that specializing to unlabeled structures will yield this exact same result. Specializing to labeled structures yields the same thing with, uh, you know, the same relationship between the exponential generating functions, which amounts to this that the number of labeled split graphs on n vertices is the bicolored graphs minus n times the bicolored graphs one size lower, uh, the labeled ones. And this factor of this uh, factor of n is because of dealing with the exponential generating functions when you, uh, yeah. Um, so then this ends up being equal to, right? And again, we know, I showed you, that was what we saw on the previous slide. We know the, the coefficients for the, you know, the bicolor generating function for labeled structures, we know that for labeled graphs. And so this becomes a summation of just, uh, you know, binomial coefficient times a power of two minus this other binomial coefficient times a, this other power of two. And this is actually a much simpler formula than what was known before. Um, they are the same, they give you the same numbers. Uh, so I guess like this, you know, sort of nested uh, uh, summations thing that they had in, you know, from this paper six years ago, I guess you know this is a uh, what what I've shown essentially is that this um, this also uh, gives you the same numbers as that other formula. Um, I mean, it's shown. I mean, because they both count the same thing. Like, I didn't actually try to rearrange one of them to become the other one, like algebraically. Uh, yeah. Uh, any any questions at this point? What are your questions here? All right, so uh, let's see, specializing. Did I want to say anything else about this? Oh, right, just that I did this indirectly. It would be great to have a bijective proof. I haven't looked that much at trying to find a bijective proof, so it could be easy. I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. And finally, um, this, this is, I think, the, the most fun part of this. Uh, this was conjectured by uh, the, the Chang, Collins, and Trank paper from 2016. And then I managed to prove it using, well, I'll talk a little bit about how I proved it. But the conjecture, which I proved, is that almost all unlabeled split graphs are balanced in the sense that the limit of you know, the fraction of them that are unbalanced goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So this issue where you can have two different part KS partitions is rare, is what that means. As n goes to infinity, it's vanishingly rare. Uh, so uh, recall, and so the to say a little bit about how so this, this is something that was in this paper, the Chang, Collins, and Trank. Uh, they pointed out that if we know that these numbers grow fast enough, if we know that the number of split graphs grows fast enough, then what we get is that this sum is dominated by its first term. And then this first term will be way smaller than the next term, right? And so if this the number of unbalanced things is roughly the number of split graphs one size lower, and that's tiny compared to the number of split graphs of that size, then that would prove it. 
all we would have to do is show that SK grows fast enough. And then so that's exactly what I did in my paper. Uh, you know, I mean, it, like I said, there's so many graphs, it probably grows fast enough. And indeed it does. Uh, and it, I use that connection with the bicolored graphs because the bicolored graphs have been counted, though with difficulty, um, right? A lot of the issue is passing to the unlabeled uh, world. Uh, and so the ingredients, I'm not really going to talk about the the proof itself. Wow, I think I'm going to finish this talk early because <laughs> I think, yeah, is this the last slide? Yeah, this is the last slide. I must have just be talking really fast. <laughs> so you'll you'll get to you'll get an extra 10 minutes to yourself today. Um, so the ingredients of this proof, first of all, like I said, the relationship that I established between bipolar bicolored graphs and split graphs. And then also once we move it over to the world of bicolored graphs, uh, then I was able to use existing results on the number of labeled and unlabeled bicolored graphs, including the quote unquote folklore result that the number of unlabeled bicolored graphs is equal to the number of bicolored graphs divided by n factorial, the number of labeled ones divided by n factorial. Now, what does that mean? I just want to say a few words about this. What does that mean that the unlabeled graphs number is equal to the labeled ones divided by n factorial? So that uh, essentially is saying that almost all bicolored graphs are asymmetric. They have no non-trivial uh, automorphisms or symmetries that are induced by the symmetric group. Uh, and so I could not find this in the literature when I was writing this paper, and I managed to prove it by sort of mimicking a proof that I found uh, that proves the, a, the, the same result. The same result is also very well known for graphs generally, that almost all graphs are asymmetric. Uh, and so I just sort of tried to use some of the same methods and managed to prove it for this one. And I put that in the paper. And in the paper, I wrote something along the lines of, you know, this seems like a fairly fundamental result in graph theory, and I'm sure it exists somewhere, but I couldn't find it. And I asked people and no one knew. So I'm just putting it in this paper because I need it for this other thing. And this was actually kind of more interesting than anything else in the paper, to be honest. But then, uh, yeah, so then when it was going through the review process, um, the I think it was the editor that was dealing with my paper, uh, you know, asked around as well, and then and then they found they found uh, they found it in in this uh, reference, but said that it was basically a folklore result in the sense that like everyone sort of knows it, and no one's quite sure where it came from originally. Uh, so yeah, that was um, that was a fun process to try to track down this this uh, formula. So so yeah, that's my talk. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and thank you all on Zoom. Thank you all in person. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, thanks, Justin. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's been a while since the in-person talk. You forgot what the procedure is, right? <laughs> yeah, does anyone have questions? On, on the previous slide? Mm -hmm. the this one? Yeah, are those, the two terms, are they the same asymptotic order in the sum? So the, you had the, uh, the asymptotics of the, the sum of the first of the two terms on the slide previous to this one. Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Right. So then do they, do they, do I think that or? I'm trying to remember. I think that this one dominates as compared to this one. So asymptotically, yeah. And that's something that is one of the things that goes into proving this in my paper. Uh, asymptotically, Sn is, is equal to Bn asymptotically. Yeah. Like, so that this term sort of is insignificant compared to that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, this is an exact formula, but then asymptotically, you don't need this part at all. Oh, yeah, for those of you on Zoom who maybe weren't, I don't know, if the question was just sort of what happens asymptotically in this line here. Um, and what happens is that this term is insignificant. Not, let's make it one more time. All right, thank you. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much for, for coming. I think that was helpful.